The 25th annual Simpsons Halloween special features a segment called The Others, in which the entire family finds themselves haunted by their own doppelgangers, who are drawn and voiced in the primitive style that the characters first appeared, long before they had their own series, when they were just a loosely characterized family in a series of crudely animated shorts on a 1980s variety show. The origin of The Simpsons as shorts on The Tracy Ullman Show is something that has become almost foundational knowledge to most fans of the show. Tracy Ullman was entertaining America with songs, sketches, and crudely drawn filler material. But what has always been an interesting mystery to me is the fact that all those shorts, and there are apparently 48 of them in total, have never been released officially, ever. <laughs> Sometimes The Simpsons will use clips of the Tracy Ullman Show shorts in episodes of the Half Hour Show, and there are bootleg copies of the rest of them out there on the internet from a variety of different sources. But for a franchise that has made such a massive impact on popular culture, 360p with a 90s Comedy Central bug in the corner is not exactly the treatment that these pieces of animation history deserve. And that's not even to mention the Tracy Ullman show itself, which not only had a handful of eventual Simpsons writers, but also Dan Castellaneta and Julie Kavner as members of its main cast. But today, that entire show is downright impossible to find. Because of complicated music licensing agreements, the show has never been released on any home video format or any streaming service, and it wasn't even really rebroadcast after the 1980s at all. In effect, this often referenced variety show, which was the origin of and practice ground for The Simpsons, has now been almost entirely lost to time. Notice though that I said almost, because I found it. I found every single episode of The Tracy Ullman Show. Should we talk about it? Of the channel change. <laughs> You're not having fun. People who have fun look like this. <laughs> For a little bit of context, on October 9th, 1985, 20th Century Fox announced its plans to form a television broadcasting network. This network would be in direct competition with ABC, NBC, and CBS, which had existed unopposed for nearly three decades. The Fox Network had a soft launch exactly one year later with the debut of The Late Show, hosted by Joan Rivers. Ah! While initially popular, ratings quickly plummeted, and Rivers quit the show after just a few months. Apparently frustrated by Fox's desire to try to emulate Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, rather than truly let her do her own thing. And that was, truly, Fox's greatest challenge in establishing itself, making a name for their network in a landscape that was dominated by three well-defined and beloved institutions. There hadn't been a fourth American broadcast network in three decades, since the shuttering of the Dumont network in 1956, so Fox was really facing an uphill battle here. But in a lot of ways, being the new kid on the block gave them a unique advantage. Without the burden of a long-established identity, they were able to take more risks in programming and strategy, which is something that became evident when they launched their primetime programming block on April 5th, 1986. The Sunday night lineup featured the debut of two brand new series. The first was Married with Children, a much cruder and more rough around the edges sitcom than anything on the other networks. Al, let's have sex. Uh, no pig. <laughs> And the second series was an offbeat variety show starring a British comedian named Tracy Ullman. Hello, my name's Tracy Ullman and my show is on next. Now, I do lots of different characters, so, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm just gonna put on my face. While sketch shows like Saturday Night Live and SCTV had been big hits with North American audiences, a true variety show with equal parts singing and dancing and other talent show-like acts, that just hadn't been attempted in quite some time. A newspaper article shortly before the Tracy Ullman show's premiere reported that each episode would consist of a 12-minute, quote, playlet, a more traditional sketch or two, some kind of music performance, and, bizarrely, a lecture, I guess, that was going to be delivered to the crowd by political satirist Harry Shearer. Soft, unyielding, and seemingly infinitely long. <laughs> the version of the show that ultimately aired, however, was much more streamlined than that, consisting of two or three lengthy sketches, usually one of them that had 
had a musical component of some kind, and then a closing monologue by Tracy Ullman to the studio audience. But you've had enough now. You've got sore buns, and thank you so much for coming. I'll go home. Go on, I'll go home too. Bye bye. And while they smartly decided against the Harry Shearer lecture segments, they did actually briefly experiment with the idea of people just doing like talent show things, like this juggler. I know you're all dying to applaud, but you don't know exactly when. Or this guy who's playing drinking glasses. Um, but they dropped that after just three episodes. Sketches on The Tracy Ullman Show often featured Ullman playing broad and outrageous characters with goofy accents and elaborate costumes. He stabbed me with a pen knife 32 times. <laughs> Ullman was joined on the show by a small group of supporting performers. There was Dan Castellaneta, who was handpicked by Ullman from Chicago's Second City Improv Group, Julie Kavner, who had co-starred on James L. Brooks' series Rhoda, Sam McMurray, a film and sitcom actor, dancer Joseph Malone, and actress Anna Levine starting in the third season. And while I'm just listing names, it's worth running through some of the many guest stars who appeared during the series run. It's actually a really impressively star-studded list, including Mel Brooks, Glenn Close, Tim Curry, Fran Drescher, Kelsey Grammer, Carol King, Cheech Marin, Steve Martin, Bill Pullman, Keanu Reeves, Cesar Romero, Isabella Rossellini, Martin Short, and even Steven Spielberg, who was there just like, you know, to do comedy, which is super weird. Well, I don't usually do this sort of thing, but when I heard that Kurosawa, Bergman, and Fellini did the show, I couldn't say no. <laughs> Because segments on The Tracy Ullman Show often ran longer than traditional sketches and sometimes had scenes that were on multiple sets, the producers were faced pretty early on with an unusual challenge. Co-creator Ken Esten said, When the sketch was over and something else started, we wanted to make it clear that that was not a cut to another scene of the same sketch. The writers and producers brainstormed a number of possible solutions to this problem. See, shows like Saturday Night Live usually had shorter sketches that were set in a single location and were usually quite different from one another. And a show like Monty Python, for example, would feature bridge material between the sketches. When deciding how the Tracy Ullman show would handle its transitions, producer James L. Brooks remembered a birthday gift he had been given a few years earlier, an offbeat comic drawn by underground cartoonist Matt Groening. Yeah, somebody had given me after, after, um, after I did Terms of Endearment, which was the first movie I directed, a, a panel of Matt Groening's a, a original art, a life in hell that he had done with 12 ways to die, die in Los Angeles. And it was, it was great. It was, you know, drive-bys, you know, freeway shootings. Uh, and the last two were to die of failure and success. <laughs> and I had that hanging up. I still have it. Right. Faded, you can barely see what's there, and I still have it. Life in Hell started modestly, fully written and drawn by Graining himself. He would sell the comic to friends back home in Portland and to the customers of the Licorice Pizza record shop where he worked. It didn't take long for the comic to catch on, and an editor for the cult publication Wet Magazine offered to publish him on a regular basis starting in 1978. Life in Hell was this super cool, very freeform thing. Sometimes Graining would use real world photos or illustrations. Sometimes it was just one single big panel, sometimes 16 or more. It occasionally told a serialized story, but was most often just a way for Graining to vent or joke about what he was feeling on any given week. In the comic, Binky the Rabbit works a series of dead-end jobs and struggles with relationships and existential dread. Other characters include Binky's girlfriend Sheba, his son Bongo, and the gay couple Akbar and Jeff, who are apparently based on Groening's poor attempt to draw Charlie Brown. Matt Groening? What's he doing in a museum? He can barely draw! No! The popularity of Life in Hell continued to grow, and in 1983, it came across the desk of James L. Brooks. During preparation for the Tracy Ullman show, Graining was brought into the studio for a meeting. While he was there, they pitched him on the idea of producing animated segments based on his Life in Hell comic strip that would air between the sketches on the Tracy Ullman show. Well, The Simpsons really began in the 15 minutes that I had to prepare for a meeting with Jim Brooks to present him with my ideas. I was originally going to do my Life in Hell characters uh, in animated form, and then at the last moment I got scared. I thought, what if this fails miserably? Uh, I'll have ruined my characters, I'll go crawling back to my, my weekly comic strip, 
So I decided to make up new characters on the spot, hence the Simpsons, uh, named after my own family. I wasn't particularly feeling creative that uh, in that 15 minutes, so I quickly named them after my own family. I do have a father named Homer, a mother named Margaret. Marge is close. I thought Marge was a slightly funnier name, and I have two younger sisters, Lisa and Maggie. I thought if I made the main kid Matt, that would be a little too obvious, so uh, I changed him to Bart. Tracy Ullman herself was originally intended to voice one or more of the family members, but it quickly became clear that she just didn't have the time to do that and to write and perform in the live action sketches as well. Instead, two of the show's supporting cast members, Dan Castellaneta and Julie Kavner, were asked to voice the father and mother of the offbeat family. This should be a time for communication. That's a good idea, dear. Bart, turn on the TV. Nancy Cartwright, who was an established voice actress, was also brought in to audition to help fill out the cast. Ultimately, the role of Lisa went to Yardley Smith, who was primarily a theater actor at the time. The Simpsons shorts were animated by an independent animation studio called Klasky Chupo, which was run by the husband and wife team of Arlene Klasky and Gabor Chupo. The couple, who had no other permanent employees, had only done non-narrative animation since the formation of their studio in a spare bedroom four years earlier. They secured the job with Gracie Films to produce animation for The Tracy Ullman Show by agreeing to color the animation for no additional cost. The freelance colorist and animator that they hired, Giorgi Pellucci, said, If you look at those drawings, they have a tendency to look a little crude or primitive, if you will. They're not cartoony. I think they're a category of their own, because it didn't look like anything that was done before. And that's why I wanted to give them a color that didn't look like anything else that had come before. She made the immortal decision to give The Simpsons yellow skin a bold choice, to which Groening apparently said, quote, You know what? That works. In addition to Peluche, Klasky Chupo hired three freelance animators, Wes Archer, David Silverman, and Bill Kopp, to bring to life the stories that were written and storyboarded by Groening himself. The Simpsons family made their television debut on April 19th, 1987, during the third episode of The Tracy Ullman Show. Titled Good Night, this story features Homer and Marge tucking their children into bed one by one and inadvertently traumatizing all three of them in the process. First, Homer fills Bart with existential dread. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Good night, son. Then Marge makes a crack to Lisa about bedbugs. Don't let the bedbugs bite. Bedbugs? And finally, she sings Rockabye Baby to Maggie. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. The final scene features Marge and Homer in bed, celebrating their expert parenting until... Yeah, but what were you saying, Dad? I didn't get the thing about the brain or matter. Could you be more specific? And again, these four scenes were not aired continuously. The scenes were split up and were used as a transition from a live action sketch to a commercial break or vice versa. Uh, notice the show's logo as the picture fades out here. Six more series of Simpsons bumpers were produced for the Tracy Ullman Show's first season. They were titled, Watching Television. Bart Jumps, Babysitting Maggie, The Pacifier, Burp Contest, and Eating Dinner. Some told a linear story in four parts, like Good Night, while others, like Bart Jumps, showcased Groening's comic strip sensibilities and were formatted more as four escalating beats of the same joke or situation. Action remained firmly at the Simpsons' house during this first season and did not feature any characters outside of the five main family members. Good drink. Good meat. Good God, let's eat. Character designs were constantly evolving, most noticeably with Bart, who appears significantly thicker in his first appearance, and whose shirt changes colors several times throughout these shorts. Homer also changes outfits a few times, while the Simpsons women stay more or less the same, although they're obviously quite different than their eventual full series designs. You can hear Julie Kavner, Yardley Smith, and Nancy Cartwright still trying to find their exact vocal tones and speech patterns, but they are remarkably recognizable from the very first short. Dan Cast Castellaneta's Homer is obviously a pretty stark departure from the version that most people know, but actually his infamous soft Walter Matthau impression would continue even into the first season of The Simpsons itself. Well, there's nothing wrong with a father kissing his son, I think. And Maggie, who has notoriously spoken very few times in the series' history, This is indeed a disturbing universe. Actually gets the last line of the very first short.
Her voice was provided here by Journeywoman voice actor Liz Georges, apparently. And additionally, Matt Groening himself performed her pacifier sucking noises throughout all these shorts, while in the series they're apparently mostly done by Nancy Cartwright. Characterization is also much looser throughout these first shorts. For example, Bart is shown to be preoccupied by complicated questions of reality, while Lisa and Marge are much brattier and quicker to anger than you might expect. Despite the obvious roughness of these seven shorts in retrospect, The Simpsons were an instant success at the time. Tracy Ullman used to take two and a half hours in makeup because she turned herself into all, you know, just heavy prosthetics. And uh, the audience would sit there for 20 minutes of entertainment, sometimes three hours. I mean, the, the hostility was extraordinary. And finally, we brought, we, we tied all the Simpson little pieces together, and that invariably got the best laughs of the night. Even though Tracy was brilliant and we did okay, that got the biggest laughs of the night. The Simpsons shorts returned for every single episode of the Tracy Ullman Show's second season, with 22 brand new shorts featuring the family. They were, again, structured as bumpers in between commercials and live action sketches. Although in the second season, some of them were split into three segments instead of four. Animation and character designs continued to evolve, while the scope expanded beyond the Simpsons family for the very first time. The Funeral features the appearance of the first non-Simpsons character. Would the family character view the loved one at this time. And sees the family leave the house for the very first time. This is absolutely the last funeral we ever take you kids to. Ah, come on, man. Grandpa Simpson also debuted in this season, and aside from a different colored shirt and a slightly more primitive voice, is essentially fully formed. Gather around, kids. And I'll tell you about the good old days. Oh, man. Actually, his first few appearances in the half hour series are pretty much in line with this early version of the character. In general, the second season of the Tracy Ullman shorts represents a significant step forward in The Simpsons evolution. The shorts mostly move beyond the escalating beats of the same situation formula, although some of the early ones still do that, and started telling stronger stories with, at the very least, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Several of them feature the family visiting a new location, like the art museum, the aquarium, or the zoo. I love you guys, but really, I'm stuffed. Thanks anyway. I couldn't eat another. And they even started experimenting with telling the kinds of stories that you would expect from The Simpsons. The short titled The Pagans explores religion, and The Money Jar deals with finance and morality, both of which were common subjects that were explored in the golden age of The Simpsons series itself. These shorts even introduced Jake the Barber, a minor character who would go on to make appearances in a handful of episodes of the Half Hour series. By the end of the second season of The Tracy Ullman Show, The Simpsons' success had skyrocketed. Nabisco licensed The Simpsons for a series of Butterfinger commercials, the first of which aired in October of 1988, just before the third season of The Tracy Ullman Show. The campaign heavily featured the short's breakout character, Bart, who delivered the instantly iconic slogan, Nobody better lay a finger on my Butterfinger. One of the two commercials that was produced during the Tracy Ullman Show era fits remarkably well with the realm of the earlier shorts, staying within the Simpsons' home and showing Bart and Lisa's typical sibling rivalry. Dad says no teasing. Na 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 na. Whoa! The other ad, however, actually expands the scope of the franchise, showing Bart at school for the first time, and it's actually the first ever appearance of Millhouse, more than a year before he would debut on the series. The campaign proved immensely successful, continuing off and on for 19 years and close to three dozen ads. Despite their relative infancy in the late 1980s, The Simpsons, and especially Bart, were a bandwagon that everyone wanted to hop onto. Around the same time, massive amounts of bootleg merchandise featuring the characters started popping up. It's clear that Bart mania was starting to sweep the nation. And these trends only continued when The Tracy Ullman Show returned for its third season in November of 1988. Now The Simpsons were billed right in the show's opening credits along with the live action cast members, and they even got their own little title screen. These changes also brought about a change in format, from the three or four individual bumpers to one continuous short of roughly the same total length. And the symbolism of these changes is very clear to me. The Simpsons were no longer the thing that you watched while you waited for the show to come back on. The Simpsons were the show. 19 new shorts were produced for the third season, which greatly expanded in scope from the previous two years. Character designs are immediately more consistent, with each member of the family appearing much closer to their eventual final design. 
design. Strangely, this is sometimes only the case in wider shots, with the characters retaining their primitive faces when they're shown in close-up. And the episode The Punching Bag even features a debut of Homer's signature annoyed grunt, or at least a version of it. Let go, Lisa. Go! Even more iconic characters were included in these new shorts, including Krusty the Clown. Come on, boy, the Krusty the Clown show! Itchy and Scratchy. <laughs> and an early version of Hans Molman, apparently. The scope continued to expand along with its character roster, with roughly half of the episodes taking place outside of the family's home, and several of them featuring non-Simpsons family characters, who are, from what I can tell, all voiced by Dan Castellaneta. Here we have Bart Simpson, the young lad who captured the notorious candy store bandit. How does it feel to be a hero, Bart? Pretty damn good, Phil. The animation itself is significantly more ambitious, even in episodes that don't technically leave the house. And the penultimate story, Maggie in Peril, is actually spread across two episodes. Although a significant chunk of the second one is just a recap of the first. <sighs> Still, it was very clear that the Simpsons were starting to outgrow their 60 to 90 second time slots. And beyond that, they were starting to outgrow their spot on the Tracy Ullman show. And they were starting to outgrow Tracy Ullman herself. And as I understand it, uh, Tracy Ullman was too busy to do any of the parts, so... She, uh, she hated it as well. She hated it. Oh, she hated really? It. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm okay. she, hated, she hated the cartoons? Oh, yes. She wanted it off the show. In June of 1989, David Silverman started storyboarding a new Simpsons short. In the story, Bart stays up late to watch a scary alien movie on TV, which gives him nightmares once he finally does go to sleep. But production on this and all other Simpsons shorts was stopped that summer. Instead, Silverman and all the other animators were moved to a much more ambitious project. And when the Tracy Ullman show returned for its fourth season in the fall of 1989, the Simpsons were nowhere to be found. In fact, their only appearance in the show's fourth and final season was a rerun of the previous year's Christmas short on the episode that aired on December 17th. But that must have certainly got lost in the shuffle, because later that same evening, a brand new Simpsons Christmas special was about to premiere. This is Bart Simpson. Totally Hidden Video is totally preempted tonight, but stay tuned for the Bart Simpson Christmas special. I mean, the Simpsons Christmas special. Sorry. Together with a few Tracy Ullman show writers, Matt Groening, along with James L. Brooks and Sam Simon, developed and adapted The Simpsons into a half-hour series following three seasons of shorts on The Tracy Ullman Show. They continued working with Klaus Hichupo, along with David Silverman and Wes Archer, although the bulk of the animation was outsourced to a South Korean studio. The four main voice actors agreed to reprise their roles as the members of The Simpsons family, while Christopher Collins and Harry Shearer were brought in to voice some of the other secondary characters. Fox agreed to produce 13 episodes of The Simpsons, and initially intended for the show to premiere in September of 1989. The episode Some Enchanted Evening, written by Matt Groening and Sam Simon, was the first script to be completed, but when the animation returned from Korea, it was so far from what the creators had been expecting that there was genuine fear that The Simpsons would be dead on arrival. On top of plenty of technical glitches, the biggest issue with the original Some Enchanted Evening was its style. Those Simpsons were a bunch of savages, especially that big ape father. In the same way that the Tracy Ullman show had revived the variety show, the primetime animated series was another long dormant genre of American programming. The most recent hit had been the Flintstones, which had been off the air since 1966. Animated specials, and especially holiday ones, were fairly common still. And I think that's what a lot of people thought The Simpsons was going to be at first. But apparently people had a really hard time wrapping their head around the idea of a animated series that would appear on a regular weekly basis, especially one that was intended for both adults and children alike. Yeah, is th is this your first, uh, uh, like it's a half an hour show? Yeah. First long hour. form animated cartoon? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And then it goes on uh, regularly uh, in January. Good for you. Oh, it'll be a series then. A series, yeah. But anyway, it was absolutely essential that The Simpsons look professional enough to be taken seriously, and not like a cheaply produced, wacky and rubbery Saturday morning cartoon. Luckily, the second episode to return from being animated in Korea, which was titled Bart the Genius, proved to be a lot closer to what the team had been expecting. But you do know what happens when you mix acids and bases, right? Of Course I do. 
Ultimately, the Simpsons series premiered on December 17th with the episode Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire, which was actually the eighth produced episode. Can we keep him, Dad, please? But he's a loser! He's pathetic! He's... A Simpson. Some Enchanted Evening was almost completely redone from the ground up and eventually aired as the first season's finale. I said you're gonna watch this tape and you're gonna do what I say or I'm gonna do something to you. And I don't know what that is because everybody has always done what I say. And apparently Christopher Collins was just kind of mean. <laughs> So they decided to get rid of him and bring in Hank Azaria instead for some of the secondary characters, like Mo the bartender and Chief Wiggum. And I was like, did you just, did that guy, you didn't like what he did? And Matt Crane was like, oh no, he was great. I'm like, so then why, why did you recast him? Like, oh, he was just a, a dick. But even with that animation style retool, the first season of The Simpsons tends to stick out from the rest of it with the benefit of hindsight. I mean, you have those weird color gradient backgrounds, some truly cursed crowd scenes, and a completely different style of musical score. <sighs> Season one represents the creative team and the animation studio getting the hang of producing a half hour series. But truthfully, it's also indicative of the show keeping one foot in the era of the Tracy Ullman show shorts. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the, Who the hell, hell are, you? are you? And in fact, several season one episodes feature scenes that are just like expanded versions of some of the shorts. For example, The Call of the Simpsons has some scenes that are very reminiscent of Echo Canyon. Boring! Lisa! Shut up! Shut up! Krusty gets busted, takes a lot from the Krusty the Clown show. You know, I base my whole life on Krusty's teachings. I base my whole life on Krusty's teachings. And the third act of There's No Disgrace Like Home is really similar to Family Therapy. Don't talk to my brother like that, you big oaf. <coughs> Give me that. that last one even throws in a self-aware jab at the short's obsession with frosty chocolate milkshakes. Yay! But that rough first season aside, The Simpsons quickly found its own identity and success. The first season won a primetime Emmy and was nominated for four others. The Tracy Ullman Show and Tracy Ullman herself also won a pair of Emmys the same year that The Simpsons debuted. But even so, Fox chairman Barry Diller was apparently dragging his feet on whether or not he was going to renew The Tracy Ullman Show for a fifth season, which would have been its second without The Simpsons. Instead, Tracy Ullman decided to end the show on her own terms. The following year, she finally lent her voice to a Simpsons character. In the second season episode, Bart's dog gets an F. In the episode, Ullman voices a dog trainer named Emily Winthrop, who's a one-time character that was created just for that episode. Now, if I could borrow Satan's little helper. Santa's little helper. She also jumped in just for this one episode to voice Sylvia Winfield, who was an early recurring character on the show that you might not remember. Simpson, this is Sylvia Winfield. That canine of yours is in my pool again. Sylvia was usually voiced by series regular Maggie Roswell in a dozen or so episodes before and after this one. And please cover your garbage. It's attracting wildlife. But the character and her husband move away from Springfield in a season four episode and have almost never been seen on the show after that. However, the relationship between Tracy Ullman and The Simpsons was apparently more tense than anyone at the studio let on because only one month after after that episode aired, Tracy Ullman filed a lawsuit against Gracie Films in the Los Angeles Superior Court. She argued that she was entitled to a percentage of the revenue generated by the series, as stipulated in the original 1987 contract that she had signed with the network. This contract reportedly guaranteed her 7.5% of the net receipts from merchandising and other profits from the products or programs based on her series. And given the massive merchandising revenue that The Simpsons was generating during the height of Bartmania, that would have been a huge huge payout for Tracy Ullman. But Gracie Films had a pretty easy defense given that, by her own admission, Ullman had nothing to do with the creation or the development of The Simpsons at all. I'm not anything to do with the, with the cartoons. I'm not any of the voices at all. It's Julie and Dan do the voices. The jury debated for less than five hours before swiftly deciding against Ullman, who now holds absolutely no stake in The Simpsons whatsoever. Tracy Ullman followed her original variety show with a string of series on HBO, Showtime, and the BBC, all of which were critically acclaimed. She was also uh, pretty funny on Curb Your Enthusiasm a couple of years ago, I thought. I'm waiting for you! 
Yeah, there's a hockey game I taped last Come night. Come on and I... watch me. Come on and watch. Still, specific nods to The Tracy Ullman Show have continued to pop up sporadically during The Simpsons' three and a half decade run. The 138th episode Spectacular in season seven features Good Night, the very first short in its entirety, and has portions of four other shorts as part of its tongue in cheek celebration of the show's history. <laughs> they haven't changed a bit, have they? The short family portrait replaces the opening sequence in the 18th season's You Can't Always Get What You Want to celebrate the series' 400th episode. Other Simpsons episodes break the fourth wall and make references to The Tracy Ullman Show itself or to Dan Castellaneta's notorious vocal performance in it. Homer Simpson? Voice does not match file from 1989. Let's go out for frosty chocolate milkshakes. Welcome, Homer Simpson. But the most common reference to the Tracy Ullman Show shorts within the main series have been the occasional appearances of the more primitive version of the family, usually portrayed as separate and distinct characters. These tend to happen outside of the show's official canon, first occurring in a season 11 couch gag. <laughs> The shorts version of Homer then appears in the Send in the Clone segment of Treehouse of Horror 13 three years later. And of course, the entire family is the focus of that segment from Treehouse of Horror 25, which parodies their designs, voices, and animation quirks. The other fun thing about that segment is that it's really bad, <laughs> which is really frustrating because I think it's a pretty cool concept actually. But for some reason, it really quickly devolves into this awkward love triangle between Homer, Marge, and the Tracy Ullman Show Marge and then everyone kills themselves. I just, I, the potential that was squandered, I, I don't know. Well, hello. Ah, a ghost! I feel like a ghost the way you haven't been paying attention to me. But in my mind, there is little doubt that the success of The Simpsons helped to cement the Fox Broadcasting Network as a television staple for decades. As for the Tracy Ullman show itself, again, it's essentially impossible to find anywhere. I mean, unless you want to like come over to my house to watch it. These rights issues have also, apparently, kept The Simpsons shorts themselves out of mainstream circulation. Outside of their use in the occasional episode of the series, only a handful of them have ever been officially released. Again, there is currently no way to purchase or stream any of them, or even to watch them in anything resembling decent quality without intrusive watermarks. So today, The Tracy Ullman Show just kind of lives on as a footnote in the Simpsons series history, which has massively outshined it in popularity and cultural impact. But here's the other thing that's really interesting. It wasn't just The Tracy Ullman Show that The Simpsons outshined. And this is where things get really juicy. Because while it's almost never talked about, The Simpsons were not the only animated shorts that were on The Tracy Ullman Show. And in fact, they weren't even the first. So you might have noticed that I said that the first Simpsons short aired during the third episode of The Tracy Ullman Show, but that wasn't the debut of animation on the show in general. The first two episodes actually featured a completely different series of animated shorts. These ones weren't created and drawn by Matt Groening, but actually by another subversive underground cartoonist. Good morning, I'm Dr. Janice Ngordatu. I have a patient coming in just one minute, but first I have to show you something. Look, I wore my slippers to the office. What was I thinking of? <laughs> The other Tracy Ullman Show shorts were created and animated by a cartoonist named M.K. Brown and more or less alternated with The Simpsons for The Tracy Ullman Show's entire first season. These shorts focused on the surreal adventures of a therapist named Dr. Janice Ngodatu. And I'm gonna really try to avoid saying that name again, jeez. Fine with me, Dr. Ngodatu. Ngodatu. Dr. Ngodatu. <laughs> Jesus. Dr. Goda... <clears throat> Dr. Ng... Dr. Ngodatu used the same format as the first two seasons of Simpsons shorts, which were a succession of separate scenes that either told a linear story in parts or riffed on the same theme. In fact, the shorts were even animated by the same Klasky Chupo team that handled The Simpsons. Julie Payne, who was a prolific bit part actor, voiced the titular character in the show, while the series' other characters were actually also voiced by eventual Simpsons voice actors. That being Julie Kavner and Dan Castellaneta, who were regular cast members on The Tracy Ullman Show, and Nancy Cartwright, who was not. Kavner plays the doctor's receptionist. Mr. Marsh is here. He's in a bad mood today. 
And Castellaneta plays her quasi-love interest, Bill Wallhead. You know, I've only had one other blind date, and that was in med school. Med school? I thought you were an attorney. I am an attorney. He also plays these demented fish tank repairmen. Something is wrong with your fish tank. That'll be 6750. Oh, 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 oh. And does what has to be, right? The first ever Homer Simpson's giggle as a drawer full of slippers. Uh-oh. Nancy Cartwright plays the doctor's friend Pat, who's scared to drive on the freeway. Well, where shall we go? Let's check out Macy's first, then hit the Emporium. That way I won't have to go on to the you-know-what. Dr. Ngodatu appears at first to be a standard, somewhat mundane series, but quickly reveals its surreal and deadpan sense of humor. Say, do you mind turning that fan off? I don't have a fan. There were a total of eight stories produced, although only six ever aired. They were The Office, Blind Date, Freeway, Fish Tank, The Dream, and Scanner. Following this episode, which aired on the July 19th, 1987 first season finale, this other series of shorts was unofficially cancelled, leaving episodes called The Party and The Proposal unreleased. And when the second season of The Tracy Ullman Show premiered in the fall, The Simpsons had fully taken over, appearing in every single episode. And to my knowledge, only one reference to its older sister series has ever been made in The Simpsons' 35 season history. And what better place to premiere their creation than on The Tracy Ullman Show? The nation's showcase for psychiatrist jokes and musical comedy numbers. That cryptic reference, now more than a quarter of a century old, psychiatrist jokes, represents the last acknowledgement of those other shorts, which have now faded into obscurity. M.K. Brown continued producing comic strips, and still does to this day. She also contributed to the stop-motion animated series Bump in the Night, and even wrote a segment of the Nickelodeon series Doug in its first season. To be clear, there's no indication that Brown feels any kind of resentment to The Simpsons or Matt Groening, but still, it's kind of hard not to feel sorry for this long-forgotten cartoon, right? In some other universe, maybe it's this one that caught on with audiences, while The Simpsons faded into obscurity. I mean, what would the Universal Studio ride look like? Would we still be rolling our eyes at the Disney Plus shorts if it were Bill Wallhead meeting Grogu instead of Maggie? These are the questions that keep me up at night. The point is, whether you're one of its forgotten contemporaries or the British comedian with whom it shares a complicated history, the only truth in this world is that The Simpsons will outlive you. Yes, The Simpsons have come a long way since an old drunk made humans out of his rabid characters to pay off his gambling debts. But it's fun every now and then to revisit the show's humble origins. Now everyone go to sleep. Good night. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm in the mood for a frosty chocolate milkshake.